Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, this is not my usual audience, um, and so you'll forgive me if uh, we get things wrong a little bit, if we uh, confuse things or get them uh, uh, a little off key. Um, it's because I'm not one of you guys. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of what we experience, I think, is pretty much in common. Um, and there is a kind of resonance between the sort of research that I do and that my colleagues do and the kinds of experiences that you have, um, particularly with systems uh, and their complexity and failure. Uh, the title of this talk is Build is, is How Complex Systems Fail, but I'm not going to talk about that because there isn't enough time. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how complex systems don't fail. And, and the reason is because it's something that we don't look at very often. We, we're pretty attuned to failure, but we don't look at, at success very, very frequently, at least in an operational setting. Those of you who work in operations know that nobody ever calls you, calls you up on the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning to say that the system is running well, and they're very happy with things. So uh, the, the outline of this talk is pretty simple. I'm going to tell you uh, just in very broad brush, brush stroke way about the past 25 years of research that we've done in this area, myself and my colleagues, um, and some of my competitors and enemies. Uh, a little bit about resilience uh, and, and resilience engineering. But first of all, I need to talk about the system as imagined versus the system as found and this principle a basic idea that I think you ought to take with you as a, a fundamental uh, kind of building block for work on, on building uh, resilient systems. Talk about resilience and resilience engineering and what that means. We have a technical definition for what resilience is now, and we've got a pretty good idea about what resilience engineering looks like. Um, and, and do this in a kind of conversational way, because most of what you're interested in is is t tweaking and tuning and stuff, and most of what I'm interested in is when things go really, really badly. I'm a regular practicing anesthesiologist, so th from my, def my definition is of things going badly is when the blood doesn't stay in the patient. <laughs> um, so the real surprise for us in this world, the world in which you work, is not that there are so many accidents. It's that there are so few. Every one of you who works in operations knows, has had that feeling of, as George C. Scott said in that wonderful film, uh, Dr. Strangelove, uh, we felt, Lord, we felt the wings of the angel of death fluttering around our foreheads. It's true, every one of you has had that sense of just barely escaping or being very near, sometimes not realizing it until the event was completely over and then looking back and realizing that all of the uh, power for your server had been kicked out except for that one cube tap that was sitting on the outlet in the corner. The question though that, that's interesting from a research standpoint is why is it that there are so few accidents? We all know that we're entitled to have many more accidents than we've had. Why are we having so few? We should be, our, the way our systems are developed, designed, run, and used, and maintained, we should be having crashes all the time. We should have systems going down all the time. We just don't have that many accidents. And the question is, why is that that way? And the, and the sort of supplementary question is, what does that mean for IT design, implementation, and ops? Or, or rather, what, what should it mean? I, I don't know what it does mean, but what should it mean? So let me give you an overview, broad brush, of, of 25 years worth of research into systems. And the, the places that we've looked include a lot of places where there are high tempo, complex, high consequence operations uh, going on. Surgical operating rooms, emergency rooms, intensive care units, uh, commercial airline cockpits, military cockpits, some military software systems. Um, I've done work in semiconductor wafer fabs, uh, which actually are extraordinarily hazardous places. Uh, some things related to electrical power distribution and generation. And, and so what do we actually see? What, what we see is this phenomenal performance. This is a picture of a bus that was blown up in, um, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, I just happened to be in the neighborhood, and um, so I got to see the Israeli response to this. And the response to bus bombings in Israel was absolutely phenomenal. These people were able to deal with the casualties in a way that would put us in the States to shame, and, and us in Sweden as well. 
um, the, the, the sophistication of their operations, the way they did it, the kinds of stuff that went on out there is, is quite impressive. You can read about this stuff on our website if you'd like to. Another place we've looked at is operating theaters. We've done a lot of work in trying to understand how operations are able to be done, particularly these very dicey things that, that involve uh, uh, real risk and hazard. As I said, we've looked at semiconductor wafer fabs, um, tried to understand what's going on there. Again, a place where there's lots of pressure, lots of time uh, 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 pressure, and lend lots of um, high consequences, and some nuclear power uh, generation settings and some power uh, repair settings. So what do we find in this? Well, I, 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 I'm going to try and give you a, a short, painful story of, of, that I think sums up what the experience with this is like. And it's just a story that I have from my own, and it's a very simple one. It involves a device that looks like this. This is an infusion pump. It's used to pump drugs or fluids into patients. Not this particular picture. It's not this manufacturer. I'm, I put up a different manufacturer's device than the device that's involved in this story. So a, a hospital was busy trying to get really up-to-date stuff. They decided to consolidate all of their stuff into a single vendor for infusion pumps because they had multiple different kinds. They went out and bought then the latest, greatest state-of-the-art infusion pump off the, uh, uh, off the rack. Beautiful device. Replaced everything in the whole hospital on the same day. Uh, brought in all the pumps, got everybody trained, got everything up and going. And um, everything seemed to be wonderful. And about a year later, at about one, uh, about, about uh, I'm sorry, the first event was about 20 minutes after 12, midnight. One of the biomedical technicians got a call and said, my pump isn't working any longer. Now, it's, it's a bad thing when your website goes down, but in my world, when pumps stop working, really bad things happen. People die or they get very, very sick. And so this guy went rushing up there to try and fix this, and it turned out that uh, he couldn't figure out what it was at the moment, but he swapped the pump out, put another one in, and they got themselves back up and running. And he, that was about the time he got the second call. And the second call was followed, as you can imagine, by the third and the fourth and the fifth call, all in rapid succession, until at about 45 minutes after the hour, it turned out that they had about 20% of the pumps in the hospital, which were no longer working. And um, they were able to figure out what the problem was and bring things back. They involved interactions with every one of the pumps in the hospital in the next 24 hours. And what had happened was when the pumps were brought in, they were all, there's lots of configurational software in this, and there's a component to the pump which is a uh, mandatory software upgrade uh, setting. And it's something that you can set in the pump. And of course, nobody was thinking about that at the time that the pumps came in a year ago. And so they set it for a year in the future. One of the un, sort of unforeseen components of this particular feature of this pump, however, was that once you've gone past the mandatory software um, upgrade time that you set in the pump's memory, it will no longer accept new commands until it gets new software. You can see that this would, would be a problem, especially if it clicks over at midnight uh, and there's nobody around except the one poor biomedical technician standing around trying to figure out what to do. Now, the real importance of this story is the way that you put all these things together. There's a feature in the device. It seems like a reasonable thing. There's some programming going on when the device comes in. It seems like some reasonable stuff. They're setting up a big operational system, and they get it up and running, and everything's going fine. There's a time bomb ticking in it that's going just waiting for the click over of the one year anniversary. Not, by the way, a uh, January 1st. It's just a year since the pump has been in service. And uh, when you reach that, all of a sudden they have this sort of catastrophic failure. What's really interesting is that nobody really thought very much of the catastrophic failure. The biomedical technician went around, fixed everything. They were able to get the systems up and running again, and, and they just sort of went back and, and tweaked that value. But what happens, of course, if the biomedical technician isn't in-house? What happens if there's no biomedical technician there? What happens if there's no operational people in your world to handle these particular devices? Well, between the time of the time, they would run fine if they were currently doing something when it ticked over. But as time went on, if you tried to change anything, the pump would stop working. So you'd go from having a setting in which you had perhaps six or 700 of these devices running in a place to a um, about 
seven or eight hours later when none of them were running. Would have been quite an event. Um, you probably have had experiences like that yourself, where you're walking along, you know, happy, whistling, and all that sort of stuff. Everything is fine. You're on your third espresso. And all of a sudden, you get this sense that something is going wrong. You're not sure what it is. It's just starting to go wrong. And, and indeed, that sort of thing is um, actually quite common. If we look at the results of the research that we've done, what we find out is that the real world often produces surprises. Surprises in the sense that you are surprised that this occurred. You haven't seen this before. I'm not talking about surprises like, oh, our, our response time is a little bad this, uh, today, or our latency is a little long. I'm talking about all of a sudden something isn't working. Some of the time, these are existential threats. That is, we're not talking about little performance variabilities, but we're talking about stuff that takes us and, and is a, actually a threat to our core mission, may, may stop us from processing stuff, may stop us from taking care of people, may stop us from being able to fly aircraft. Um, and, and the other thing that's true about the world is that the demand and the op tempo varies a lot, that, that, that it's not constantly being beat on. It happens at, at uh, periods and times when things are going wrong, things are going badly, but it's not always that way. So it, it's a real variable world. You can't predict it very well. Uh, a, a phrase that was given to me by one of the operational people that I uh, interviewed was, stuff don't work as advertised which is a real problem because there's lots of stuff that we have in our systems that we don't actually try out for many, many years after they're installed. And then we go out and try and use it and find out that it doesn't work the way that we expected it. That novel conditions are common, um, that things that you haven't seen before actually do occur relatively frequently. Uh, that there's lots of adapting and tailoring. That is, systems are not sort of working out of the box. They don't come in a box. But if they did, they don't work out of the box. They have to be tweaked and tuned and coddled and stroked and kissed and prayed to, and you have to burn the right kind of incense in order to get your systems to run. There's a lot of tailoring that goes on where people twist and turn and, uh, and shave off here and turn on and turn off various kinds of services and start and stop other kinds of things and set parameters to try and make the thing go. I call that tailoring. You tailor the systems that you work with. And then there's the unanticipated variety that comes along. People start using your system in ways that you didn't expect them to. They're using it for things that, they didn't, that you didn't plan them to use it for. For instance, starting to use um, your email system for something like sending great large files around or things like that. And, and against all this, there's this continuous change of technology and people. There's constant moving of things going around all the time so that the world that you live in is, is anything but static. And finally, that's common with all these worlds, they're coping all the time with both shallow and deep conflict. Shallow conflict, can we make a little more? Can this run a little better? Am I getting along with this person? Is this guy giving me a hard time on the phone? And deep conflicts, like we really have to trade off something here. Are we going to take the system down for a while to try and fix this? Or are we going to try and fix it on the fly? The kind of decision that you have to make all the time. If you sum all this stuff up, it's, it's really summed up in, in, in sort of two phrases. The first is that the normal world is not well-behaved. Those of you who feel like you live in a well-behaved, well-structured, very predictable, nice world are probably living in a fantasy or you're not operational people. <laughs> in fact, if there's anybody in here who does feel that way, um, we would like to know what company you work for because we're all going to sell the stock that we own in that company. <laughs> the other thing is that's so interesting is that that even so, even though the world is so badly behaved, uh, in a lot of operational settings, we have a lot of success. And the real question that we're faced with is, is this because of or in spite of the designs of the systems that we have? Are we getting the successes that we have because they're designed into the system, or are they, are they coming from some other source? And that brings me to this idea about systems as imagined versus systems as found. And I think this is a pretty big divide, and it's an important one to get a hold of. Most systems are imagined. They do not, very, very few people have much contact with the system as found. Systems are imagined, they're, they're, they're state diagrams and their layouts of rack panels and their floor diagrams and all sorts of this. These are systems as imagined. It's the way we make stuff. And they're static and deterministic, okay? Those systems as imagined have static and deterministic kinds of qualities. Systems as found look more like this. 
you recognize the use of an antiquated device for communication with a long coiled wire on it and the positioning of the person suggesting that the communication is being taking place under some sort of stress. <laughs> Here's another nice photograph. Um, some of you will recognize this as your own system. If you cannot read the sign there, it says, uh, it says do not touch any of these wires. <laughs> and what you rarely see in systems as imagined is this sort of picture, people actually doing work, people sitting in front of screens making the system run. And, and these systems, the systems as found, are dynamic and stochastic. They are not deterministic, they are entirely stochastic. Their performance cannot be deterministically uh, defined, it's, it is a stochastic process. As, and, and to make things worse, as one of the people in this room said, we're always doing some sort of maintenance. The maintenance intervals is essentially zero. The MTBB, the mean time between uh, MT, uh, MTBM, uh, the mean time between maintenance is zero. You're always doing something. So if we compare these two views now, you've got the ima as imagined view represented by the state diagram. This is a static view. It's a deterministic type system. It's encountered during design, it's encountered during development, it's the only way you can develop these systems, and it's encountered in reviews of outcomes after systems have failed. Any kind of review or evaluation of a system after failure is always done in this as-imagined kind of world. Um, the, the sort of archetype of this is, uh, you know, a, a state transition diagram, or, the, or for failures it would be something like a uh, uh, like a fault tree analysis. Some of you probably do fault trees, some of you may do um, uh, probabilistic risk assessments, but that's basically a system as imagined. The system as found is characterized by being dynamic, it's constantly changing, it's stochastic, it's only, it's only predictable in some sort of statistical way. And it's what we encounter during implementation, during operations, and during maintenance and recovery from transients. And it's it's really hard to draw these things. One of the ways to do it is with a FRAM uh, drawing. FRAM is a, uh, a functional resonance analysis method developed by a friend of mine named uh, Eric Holnagel. When we look at these systems as found, though, we, we, we ask the questions broadly, and I mean this not just for your groups, but across all of these different groups that we've studied. What are people doing in these as-found systems? What does operations look like? And it's really got four components. It's got some monitoring activity, that is people looking at the system to try and understand what's going on in it. It's got some responding activity, that is responding, in the, not in a reacting sort of sense, but responding in the sense of understanding what's happening in the system and trying to anticipate where it's going and make changes to deal with that. They are constantly adapting, that is, they are trying to make the system work differently so that they can get it to behave in a better way. And, and significantly, there's a lot of learning going on about the system. The system, the learning in the system is a key component of what's happening. And that learning is taking place in operational communities that most of us don't ever have any contact with. There are groups of operators, there are groups of people who very often are doing shift work, very often paid by the hour, very often anonymous in, in corporate hierarchies, very often uh, people who are um, uh, largely outside of the social groups that most of you tend to travel in. But they are the sources of what we call now resilience. Resilience is the combination in systems of these four kinds of activities, these qualities, are the qualities that go together to form resilience. If you looked at this again and you thought about it, what, is, what are we talking about here? We're talking about monitoring and responding and adapting and learning. And we, we're actually putting those all together. Those are terms that are trying to describe what we mean by resilience. And, and in fact, the question is, what are we doing? Well, in, in we, when we design these systems, we design them for reliability. That's the code word that you encounter most of the time. How, long, how reliable is the system in which you're working? And what does reliability involve? It involves making stiff boundaries, lots of layers, lots of formalisms, 
lots of defense in depth, lots of redundancies, lots of interference protection, various kinds of securities around your systems, lots of, of things like abstractions and, and uh, the hiding of the details in various kinds of objects, lots of assurance mechanisms, lots of formal reviews, and lots of accountability functions. That's what reliability is, is made out of. And when you make reliability out of that stuff, you do it at the design time. But what we really want in our systems is resilience. We want systems to be able to withstand transients. We want them to recover smoothly and swiftly from failures. We want, them to, we want to be able to prioritize high level goals when the system's changing and we can't have to sacrifice something. We need to be able to choose which goals we should satisfy and which ones we should sacrifice. We have to be able to recognize and respond to abnormal situations, including situations that were never considered at design time. And finally, we have to find a way to adapt to change. We have to find some way to make these systems which were designed in the mindset of four to seven years ago work for the next three to five years while we're building the systems that will be obsolete when we install them. So how do you design for resilience? Well, we have this problem. We have the ima as imagined world that sits out there. And we have the as found world. And they're two, as I've tried to su suggest to you, two quite separate worlds. They, they look at different things. They work on different sorts of principles. And the question is, can you bring them together? Can you get an as engineered world that includes this quality of resilience? And this is not the $64,000 question but the $64 million question, or maybe even more. In the world in which I normally work, it's the life and death question. But in the world in which you work, it may be the corporate life or death question. Can you make systems, can you actually engineer them ahead of time so that it is possible in operational time for them to have the resilience that you want them to have? And I, I would say to you that, that I think that this is true, and I'm going to try and give you a list of things that I think you could do in designing your systems that would lead to the ability to have resilience in those systems at operations time. The first is the support for continuous maintenance. I think the idea of doing maintenance on systems is completely uh, uh, misstated or misrepresented as this sort of periodic or interval activity. I think if you actually look at the systems that, that are under your partial control or under your management, you'll find that they are constantly being uh, maintained in some way. And I mean by this software maintenance, hardware maintenance, personnel kinds of activities, physical plant maintenance, a whole variety of things. And I think that we have to design systems in which maintenance activities have now become so much a part of the system that they're actually part of the design of it, rather than something that we add on later using RPM code or something like that. I think we have to, we have to start revealing the controls to these systems to the operators. When it's 3 o'clock in the morning, the only people who are going to be able to help you are the operators and the, and the control people who are sitting in front of the screens that actually control your system. And the way to make them able to, to deal with problems is to reveal the actual controls that are available there. I think it's absolutely essential that we recognize that the strength of the operator community is such that we must trust them with the controls to our systems. This sounds a little bit subversive. Because many of you, as you design systems, are actually involved in trying to make it impossible for people to do things. You're trying to protect your systems from people doing things. But in fact, I think that when we look at resilience and we make resilience our goal, we recognize that what we have to do is we have to develop some way of trusting people because we need them to act in situations where they're the only ones who are going to be able to do so. And therefore, we have to actually reveal and expose the controls of our systems rather than trying to hide them away. I think we have to show the lift points. Any of you who've gone around, uh, worked around any heavy machinery or anything like that, recognize that when heavy machinery is moved, it's dangerous and hard. And so almost all heavy machinery has markers on it that shows where to lift it. We do that because we know it's going to get moved. We have to start building systems that show the lift points in the system itself. Where can I pick it up and move it? How could I actually take it 
and move it outside of the current system that I have and replace it with something else. And I think we don't do that very well in code. We don't do it very well in structures. And we certainly don't do it very well in our organizational stuff. Most of our, our planning for maintenance is done at a kind of microscopic level that, that has no awareness of the kinds of things that can really happen. I think we have to support mental simulation. And this means having people have clear ideas about how the system is actually configured and running. You need to be able to have operators and the people who are working in your operations world be able to mentally simulate what is going to happen if they take some action, which means that they need to have access to deep knowledge of the system and its current status. And it also means that you, as, as the designers of those worlds, have to present that information to operators so that they can see what's going on. You have to actually think about the kinds of situations that operators are going to confront and the kinds of work that they're going to do. And you have to support the mental simulation that they're going to do as they're trying to figure out how to make the system work or recover. I think you have to open the objects and open your methods. I think that this idea about hiding in levels of layers of abstraction, everything about the details is, in fact, pretty much run its course now. I think the idea that we can make these sort of black box devices that we only know about the shell of and have no knowledge of the internal workings of is in fact a deep mistake. Because it turns out that in order to be able to make and reason about how the system is actually working, we have to have knowledge about what's inside the black box. What's the hardest thing to do when you buy a new PC? What's the hardest part of the setup? getting the wireless working, right? Because you bought the PC, and you've got this wireless card, and you're doing this thing, and you're trying to get it going, and should I use the Windows version, or should I use the manufacturer's version? I have two versions. Should I, how, where should I set? Should I set this parameter to this? Should I set this parameter to that? No. The problem here is that you must be able to get off and, and see inside these layers. I think we have to deep six the don't touch me's. We have to get rid of this idea that there are parts of the system that cannot be operated and where we can't go. And I think we have to empower the operator learning. What's the resilience agenda? I think there's operations. I think the first agenda item for me is to convince you that operations are competent to hold the keys to the systems you build. That you should be willing to turn over the keys of your systems to your operations people. And if you don't have that confidence in them, you must do that, you must develop that. The second is that you've got to make resilience engineering the first priority for the design of your next generation systems. And finally, you have to commit the resources to discovering, understanding, and supporting resilience throughout your component life cycle. There's a bunch of stuff out there that you can look at. There's some papers by myself and my colleagues. Um, there's a, uh, some books on resilience engineering. If you search on the terms resilience engineering in quotes, and the, the name Holnagel, you'll get all this stuff. If you go to my uh, site, www.ctlab, there's a couple of papers out there that would be useful to you. My time's up. Thank you very much. And whatever you do, don't visit me in my office. <laughs> <laughs>